Hey, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas. It's Saturday morning, my friend, and you are listening to Light Talk. Good morning. This is Dan in Gainesville, Florida. Today we're discussing colorblind directors, pools on stage, begging for jobs, the Celebrating America inauguration show, and couch potato exercises, all on Light Talk. This is David, coming to you from the beautiful Belmont Shore neighborhood of Long Beach, California. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk, and we are the Lumen Brothers. Still look chugging along here at 200. Episode 200. <laughs> Have you ever traveled 200 miles an hour in your car, David? I No. <laughs> My car doesn't go to 200 miles an hour. What's the fastest you traveled in a car? In a car? Yeah. That car. I was driving or someone else was driving? Does it matter? Uh, the fastest I ever traveled was 160 some odd miles. How about you, Steve? Uh, I do not speed. <laughs> <laughs> this was this was on I was in a track. It was not on public roads. I'm telling know. you that right now. I, Go ahead, I, here. I think we were in a Mercedes like I don't know 700 series in Germany on the autobahn a oh, few years ago, yeah. and I think we hit like one 175, 180 maybe. It was crazy what? fast. Kilometers miles, per hour? No, miles, mile per miles. We had it set to miles. That's really fast. When you, st- when you stall down to 60, it feels like you're, you're, you're going backwards. Well, you do go backwards in time if you go too fast. <laughs> Isn't that what that car was? In, That's uh, what Back that DeLorean the was. That took yeah, the, the, the exactly. flux capacitor. The flux right? capacitor. So anyway, look at the 200 episodes. You believe that we've actually done 200 episodes. I don't want to believe it. That means 200 weeks, you know. I don't want to believe it. 200 weeks ago today, we started this crazy little podcast. Spreading joy around the known world. Spreading joy. (laughs) And insanity. Yeah, like like Santa's elves we are. (laughs) Throughout the world. (laughs) All these crazy people. I can just see us on the sleigh going to the Faroe Islands. We still haven't broken into Antarctica, and I'm I'm mightily pissed at... uh, McFarland Station. Yeah, we're not yeah, that, at that the station yet. Well, we're not there yet. You know, well, Biden's in. Anything could happen now. So 200. And yeah, what an amazing uh, celebration of America during the inauguration. Did you guys watch that? Of course. Every minute of it. <laughs> of course, because we're talking about it. At Let's talk about <laughs> Yeah, it was pretty amazing. And uh, we're going to talk a lot about that later on in the show. Uh, do we have any news today? Grad recruiting is not the greatest right now. Oh, why not? Well, we got our numbers and they were sort of, let's just say if you were thinking it like an accountant, flat. Like basically, <laughs> you know, the, the balance sheet has not gone up or down. We're well, graduating so many students and we'd be able to bring in the same number that we're graduating. So it's a little bit, could have been worse as a state institution. I'll just I'll try to look, look at it on the upside. It could have been worse. So you, you could have been a California state school. All right. So we do have one bit of news. We have a correct answer to our light talk puzzler. It came from Drew Belinsky, uh, you know, light talk uh, groupie. He's, one our, our, one of our, He's our number one fan. <laughs> he was one of the first 50 back 200 episodes That's that right. suffered through the episode where we're shouting at our laptops and using <laughs> the, uh, the laptop uh, microphone to, <laughs> you know, what Those were the days. <laughs> Again, but we yeah. got to warn people, do not listen to episodes one and two because we c- will not be responsible for any brain damage that occurs from listening to those episodes. But they are funny. Uh, well, what had happened is my garage door opener, a a proud craftsman garage door opener, um, has two lights on it. So when the uh, uh, on each end of it, so when the thing activates, turns the door on, and the two lights come on at the same time. Yeah, your garage door wasn't working. That was the problem, right? You were trying to figure out what was wrong with the. And it just stopped working. Right. And what had happened is I was kind of being, you know, all green one day, and I thought I'll take those incandescent lamps out and put them in the garbage, and I will get myself two fancy LED light bulbs and put in. And what had happened is the LED light bulbs were canceling out the. Uh, um, the signal, the frequency was messing with the signal going to the garage door opener, so it would not open. I mean, I could have the little clicker six inches away and it wouldn't open. So I went to the garbage, got my incandescent light bulbs, put them back in, and went, <laughs> wow, it works. So, and then I called a garage door opener company, and they went, oh, yeah, it oh, happens yeah. all the time. That's <laughs> how we sell new garage door openers. <laughs> You can actually buy a, a fancy little thing for about $80, and it 
slaps onto your garage door and it uh, keeps that frequency from interfering, the LED frequency from inter- inter- interfering with your uh, little clicker. Changes it from, I don't know, 300 megahertz to 600 megahertz. But I, I didn't need to do that. I just got my light bulbs out of the garbage. So one lesson is that LED light bulbs put out radio frequency. They're Satan. Well, that's great. And since that's the only news we had, let's get on with the show. Steve has our first question. Okay, John in the Republic of California writes, I have a show which has a small pool on stage. I have several floor lights near the pool. Can I put those lights on a GFCI and run that to a dimmer? Well, first thing, you know, what is a GFI? A GFI or a GFCI, they're kind of the same thing. It's a ground fault interrupter. You know, the GFCI and the GFI, they're, I mean, I think they're exactly the same device, just slightly different name. The GFCI is more commonly used than the GFI, but I think the term's interchangeable. Anyhow, it is a circuit breaker and an outlet that protects people from electrical shock. So when John is in the shower and he turns on his uh, blow dryer, the GFI, you know, clicks and he doesn't electrocute himself. <laughs> um, and the idea behind this is that it works like instantaneously. It trips that breaker and you are safe from electrical discharge. However, however, <laughs> I, I would not use um, a ground fault interrupter on a dim circuit. I, I think that's you're just asking for sorrow there. And I don't even know that you could get it to work because the idea behind this is you need a constant flow of electricity to uh, the circuit to make it work. So varying that voltage going to it, I think it'll just keep tripping and eventually it'll never reset. But do not use a GFCI with a dimmer. This this is just a bad idea. Um, You know, I went to the repository of all knowledge on this question. Wikipedia? <laughs> close, close. <laughs> I, 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 bring you, I bring you the magical Steve Terry. Oh, and well, what that's... Steve Terry has to say is that um, you should use a shock block. And a shock block you can find through uh, TV and film rental houses. It is a ground fault circuit interrupter, but it is made for uh, the exact thing you know, you're know you trying to do. And you've seen this on film sets all the way from, I don't know, Titanic to the latest X-Men movie. But that's a fairly beefy, expensive, well-made box that uh, works to protect people in damp environments. But nothing is going to protect you the way safety is. So you're just going to have to uh, be very careful When you introduce electricity close to water on stage. Wow. I needed one of those shock blocks when I was an undergraduate student working in a non-grounded theater. You know what the shock block was there? Me. (laughs) Two by by four. (laughs) It was was me grabbing hold of a pipe with one hand and light on the other on a metal ladder and having that electricity flow right through my body down into the ground. Boy, that was fun. Well, that's a, I have to say, Steve, this was a really great question. I didn't know the answer, and I was really excited to hear what you were going to say. And I knew I'd learned something, and that you did your due diligence by going to the source with Steve Terry. And now I know <laughs> I the went term to Yoda. shock block. They went to Yoda. Is, Yoda of electricity, Steve. <laughs> and I know that in, in my home, when I have a lot of them, I had a hot tub, and I have my, orchi- my uh, landscape lights on these GFCI outlets. And, of course, there's one in the bathrooms. It seems that when it rains here in North Florida and it gets really moist outside, that sometimes causes them to trip. And I was wondering if it's if it's moisture related or it is it is to protect for water. Right. Isn't that part of the idea? Right. Says it's designed for outdoor and indoor wet location filming. Uh, The rental shock block line provides the inline plug in installation of high current electrical equipment featuring a six milliamp trip level an inverse uh, response time in accordance with UL 943 Class A applications. Well, yeah, I'm on the Little Fuse. <laughs> I'm on the Little Fuse website. I put it in Shock Block, and it took me to Little Fuse, and they've got their Shock Block rental products. It's a pretty big thing, actually. Yes, yeah. it, it looks like an old 
six pack dimmer. From yeah, what like I can a power, tell. Dis- power distribution box. Well, right? it handles up to a hundred amp load. So I mean, if you you've got that uh, five ten, you know, twenty k Fresnel out there, you know, you've you've got something in line to to uh, protect you. Cool stuff. Yeah, but it's important. What's important is don't put your home Home Depot ground fault. <laughs> In line with, with your dimmer. ETC dimmer. This right. is just a bad idea. There is nothing good can come from that, John. <laughs> you know, and if you everybody's met- such a klutz, they're going to electrocute themselves. Take the pool out of your show. Can I just share? An, <laughs> I just got to share this image for you because you mentioned Steve Terry, so I'm, I'm back in my production arts imagination. And back in the day at 636th 11th Avenue, there was a piece of plywood with a Kliegel Performer 3 bolted to it, hanging on the wall. And the two monitors that were built into the Kliegel Performer were blown out. And it was put up there with a big sign that said, you better use a ground. That console was set up at Hershey Park where they had this big outdoor theater. And for some reason that summer, the, they, everything else was grounded, but they, they just ran a convenience outlet to the console with no, uh, no earth ground. And it took a lightning hit and it blew up the Kliegel. So PA put that up on the wall as a reminder that that should never be done. So safety first. Tracy in Florida writes, I have worked at a small theater for two seasons as the master electrician. I want to be a lighting designer. How do I go about getting to design a show there? You know, this I've been thinking about this question for a couple of days, and I think it's a really, what kept coming to mind was like skating on thin ice. Like, how do you do this delicately? How do you be diplomatic? You know? Uh, it's a whole Pandora's box. It is a Pandora's box, and, and it's, it's, it's a tangled web we weave <laughs> on this one. It's like, let, okay, let's just ask some, I don't really have the answer, but I do have a bunch of questions, and these are rhetorical, so you guys just jump in. How well do you know the designer who designs? Are there multiple designers who come through? Is there a resident designer? Do you have a resume? Do you have a portfolio? Can you show some work that sort of shows your skills? Is the designer your friend? Could he or she maybe throw you a show when they're busy? I mean, there's so many ways to sort of, I think you just have to, you, I'll get, all right, maybe I'll tell a story. So when I was young, I was the master electrician in a performing arts facility, and there was a guy who was the, I'll even say his name, his name was Jerry Rothman. He was very brilliant. He was a set designer, and he was a lighting designer, and he was the technical director, and he got all the shows. And he was, one nice thing about Jerry is he was always late. So we would be painting scenery in the shop, join act one, when act two was going up on opening night. He wasn't really an on time kind of guy, but he was talented and he did all the shows. And I was the electrician and I would see his work and it was good. And I thought I could do just as good and I want to design a show. And, you know, and I sort of became a little bit of, a, of an annoying person asking everybody or making it known that I wanted to design a show. And in some ways I regret how annoying I was. I was basically wanted to take money out of this guy's pocket, or I wanted to show that I could do it too. And eventually they gave me a chance and I didn't know what I was doing. I hadn't even been trained, you know, and the work was meh. Okay. And he made it pretty clear that the work was not, <laughs> it was not as good as the work that he would do. So ultimately, you know, I still ended up with a career and then sometimes you do have to push a little bit. So I think it's a really delicate dance. So I think I would, you know, maybe be discreet, talk to the, talk to the resident designer, make sort of like make drop little subtle hints. If, if somebody asked to see your work or what would you do? I mean, I mean, I don't really have a formula for this. I think it's about situational awareness. So you know you want to do it. You're at a place where maybe you could do it. Maybe you could get some work somewhere else and then bring some pictures in and show it to the artistic director of the small theater. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a tough one. What do you guys have any advice for Tracy here that I, I don't know if I've handled it all, all that this well, but I, I have been thinking about it. Tracy, just walk up and ask them. Just walk up to the artistic director or the or the production company manager right, company or the production manager. director right. and say, hi, it's me. I've been here two years. I've been working really hard as a master electrician. I like my job. I want to do some design. Is there anything, is there a small show that I might be able to work into in the season? Or can you help me? Or can you help connect me during our off season with another theater? Just be honest. And, and they'll, they'll say, no, 
<laughs> We're not going to do it. <laughs> or, or you know, maybe it's maybe they're doing eight giant musicals, and you're not quite ready to do that. But maybe all of a sudden they throw in Odd Couple, something that's a little bit more manageable that you can take a bite at, and they say, sure, we've got a we've got a you know a sofa comedy that we think you could do. You know, you might even uh, if you you know if you have a resident designer, those things have kind of gone the way of the buffalo. You might ask if you can expand your job with no additional pay to be the assistant to the designer. You'll be the Emmy, but you'd like to start learning about design and could you assist on a couple shows? So that's a possibility. So I think there's a lot of ways to do this, but you have to start by talking to them and just being honest. You're not trying to fire anybody. Uh, you're not, you know, don't go in there and bang your hand on the table and say, I deserve this. That's what I did. <laughs> well, well, yeah, and we heard the story of that one. <laughs> don't do what Stan did. <laughs> take, Steve's, take Steve's advice. <laughs> All right, so this is really tricky. And uh, I'm going to tell you something that um, a very famous designer who I was assisting at the time, told me I was a very young person. And I was never really a very good electrician, although I served as an electrician on uh, school shows. But mostly I designed uh, because we didn't have anyone else. uh, So I'd be a designer and electrician. But one thing this designer told me, and I don't know if it's always true. I knew it was true back then. I don't know if it's true anymore. I think it may be, is that unfortunately with very few exceptions, but there are some exceptions, you are either going to be a technician or you're going to be an artist. And people see you that way. It's not that you can't be a technician and an artist, because I know many technicians who are artists. I know many artists who are technicians. However, there is an impression that people have in the theater that you are either a technician or you are an artist. And it's really hard for a technician to break out and say, hey, I want to be an artist now. Because everybody's thought, everybody's th- think of you as a master electrician, right? Which is very important. Thank God for master electricians. <laughs> I'd burn down theaters <laughs> if I didn't have them. But it's, seriously, uh, it is, it is uh, the way it unfortunately has worked in this business. Now, again, I think that um, what Steve said was really, and, and Stan, it's really good. Find out what the situation is. If maybe it's a small community theater, or maybe it's a small regional theater that, like Steve said, um, you know, they're doing a bunch of musicals, but maybe there's a small show that you could do. Uh, and then you prove yourself that way. But uh, I, it's very difficult. It really is to be. You know, both. your point, David, about technicians versus designers. I think that's a false equivalency. I don't even think it should be made. It's a. I think it's a, a terrible. Uh, I'm not way saying it. I'm not saying it should be made. I'm just no. saying that's the fact. No, no, I'm not saying. I'm not saying you're advocating for it. I'm, you're pointing out that it exists, and I wish. I wish we could just make that go away. But you know, some people just want to be technicians too. That's fine. And some too. people just want to be designers. That's I've right. always wanted to just be a designer. I, I right. electrocuted myself much too many right. times. But you, but you, to can, be, but you, know, but you can have technician. a love for both. I mean, that's the thing I learned by going to Florence the first time and seeing the Renaissance artists. They embraced both. They embraced the technology and they embraced the art. They were, they were, they didn't make that separation. And I love that. So I think, so, and I feel, I, I feel a kinship. Like, I like technology and I like art. I like both. I don't, I don't like to be put in one basket or the other. Well, I was told that I should not even during breaks being hanging out with technicians. Well, that's what they used to tell people. I think I don't agree with that. I don't either because I do hang out with technicians. You know, the best uh, example were the electricians at the Royal Opera House in Covent Garden. They asked me, they said, hey, mate, you want to go and have a beer? Of course. Absolutely. Let's go across the street to that famous bar where they all hang out between queues and have a few pints. And, you know, I have a blast. And that's the same thing at uh, Central City and a lot of places I work at. But unfortunately, there is that situation. I that think it's. Is I think we should push. I industry. think that should go the way of the dodo, to use Steve's words. Well, sometimes it. it I mean, I think. I mean, let's go down to the very kind of bargain basement entry level. So let's not talk about Broadway designers or people who have done something um, in a different way. But sometimes what you see, and I see this occasionally with students who are trying to make the transition from technical director to set designer. Uh, they cannot bring themselves to cut a piece of uh, 
a four by eight sheet of plywood up. <laughs> they, they just can't do it. Oh, that's terrible. You know, the uh, the platform would be a lot better if it were a three by seven. <laughs> but in, but in the back of their head, you know, from high from high school, and maybe they're college. Save over. that four uh, by eight. <laughs> you got to save that sheet of four by eight. <laughs> or or you know, I'll see it the same same thing with very very inexperienced lighting designers. It'll be like, well, this is where Fresnels always go. They they but because I mean they're just used to doing things a certain way. I think this is a great question. Uh, it's amazing that it's taken four years for us to, for us to get this question. Maybe I lost track of what's been said, but also um, I think what we're saying, Tracy, if you're serious about this, maybe it's time to walk away from being a master electrician. Finish out the season, shake their hand and thank them for all the opportunities, and now put your shingle out, Tracy, lighting designer. Right. And start or go there. go to grad school. If you don't feel like you're totally prepared, but you'd yeah. love to be an artist, go to grad school. You know, Dave, uh, can I say, uh, to amplify Steve's point, you know, we had this wonderful bit of news, sort of uh, UF news. We had Thaddeus Strasburger come to class on Monday, and, th- and I met him thanks to David and Light Talk. And he, some students, the students asked really good questions, mm-hmm. and one of them was about this. And he said, like they asked him how he got started being a director, and he, he talked about things leading up to his career, but he said, I just started telling people I was a director. <laughs> Just start telling people you're a lighting designer, Tracy. There you go. So Jennifer from D.C., the District of Columbia, which I heard today a new bill is in Congress to make D.C. a, a state, by the way. Yes. And uh, that's, uh, they'll probably never make it through the Senate. Idiots in the Senate. Uh, but anyway, Jennifer in D.C. writes, Dear David, you are not shy about working with directors. Really? I thought I'm very shy about that. I am working with a red-green colorblind director. (laughs) We will work on three shows in rep this summer. Any tips or things I should be thinking about now? Well, Jennifer, if you are a longtime listener of Light Talk, uh, way back in the first dozen or half dozen episodes, I talk about working with a colorblind director when I was in my undergraduate days at the University of Miami. A wonderful man named Buckets Lowry who was a great director, uh, was also had a great eye for light, believe it or not. <laughs> but he was colorblind, and he would always come to rehearsals with these blue sunglasses because apparently it helped him see a little more color somehow. I have no idea. I am not a, uh, a doctor, so I can't say exactly what, how they helped. However, we did many shows together. We lit the shows together. He taught me so much about lighting, uh, amazing, amazing director. Anyway, if this director is experienced already, they know already what their limitations are, and they are going to ask you and depend on you to be able to communicate what is going on with the color. If things are colder, if things are warmer, if there's a contrast you're trying to create, you should think more about explaining that type of color contrast to the director instead of just saying, can't you see it? <laughs> because that director can't see it. So you really need to be patient. I was very patient with Buckets. A lot of times he did ask me, David, is this going to be too blue? Right? And I'd say, no, actually, I think it's going to be all right, Buckets. He'd go, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> that's the way he talked. So that's what I, I suggest. Be patient and, and get ready to explain more about color contrast and warm and cool and the feeling of the atmosphere. Well, I would say something about the colorblindness. So in red, green colorblindness, what happens is that those colors de- desaturate because that's where the, the, the weakness in the red-green cones is compensated for in the ratio to the low-frequency blue rods. So everything looks a little bit pale. I'm curious how, I, I, I'm not quite, I'm curious how the blue glasses helped him. And, and, then, and then you <laughs> say it, 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 gave he, him, it gave him courage to speak his it mind. It did, it did, you know. And, and, it, and he like, looked cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In fact, I'm teaching this week, uh, I'm in my grad two class in spring, and I'm teaching out of uh, vision and art. And in the, we're in fact, we're in the chapter on color today. So I have this image in my head. She, um, Dr. Livingstone shows three images, one of uh, a grayscale of this piece of art, then of it's under normal uh, normal eyesight, and then what it would look like to a red-green colorblind person. And you can see that the colors are there, the reds and the greens, but they're just muted because 
because those cells are not performing the way the rest of us do. So everything just looks paler, but the chroma is there. And that's what, the, that's what they're having difficulty seeing because the, because, because the low frequency rods that you use under low light conditions, they have fantastic sensitivity to luminance, which is a separate system than color, which we've, I've talked about before, as she, as she explains. So, that, so, that, so it's curious to me, he, he would probably see, he, he would see blue more so where it, when it's not there because, but the blue cones also have a bit of green and yellow, but they really, really lack in the red. So it's a really interesting thing to uh, just try and understand color blindness. And when you see images that show you the difference between the color blind, what the color blind person sees versus what we would see, it really sort of helps. So that would be one piece of advice. Uh, for Jennifer to sort of uh, really familiarize yourself with the with the differences, so that then maybe to take St David's point, you'll be able to explain it better. And I highly recommend that book once again, uh, Vision and Art by Margaret Livingstone. You are listening to Light Talk, and today Light Talk is sponsored by the Lumen Lighten Up Club. So, how is that New Year's resolution going? Have you lost those COVID twenty pounds yet? I didn't think so. But why should you? Many believe that you don't really need to be in good physical shape to be a lighting designer. I mean, really, what physical activities do lighting designers have to do? Sit and draft? Sit at the production meetings? Sit and write lighting cues? Sit and drink vodka? Well, the truth is that it takes a great deal of endurance, flexibility, and the lithe movement of a ballet dancer to maneuver around the theater. We are constantly avoiding onrushing set pieces, climbing steep rakes, running up and down aisles, and navigating over dangerous pit bridges, and all of this usually in the dark. And how about squeezing between people sitting at the production table row, or doing a head dive as you foolishly avoid the squeeze and instead climb and tumble over the seats? Unfortunately, the pandemic has put a pause to these challenging maneuvers. Instead of working up a sweat running in the dark, we have been sitting at home, eating, drinking, and watching Netflix, and we get bigger and bigger. Well, Tubby, the end of the pandemic is in sight, and it's time to get back into shape with the Lumen Lighten Up Club. Yes, the Lumen Lighten Up Club features cardio exercises you can do all while watching upside-down chess moves on the Queen's Gambit. Our couch potato friendly exercises includes our challenging remote control juggling. Work on your agility and coordination as you try to beat the clock by finding the correct remote that controls your Apple TV. Or work up a good lather by running the Lazy Pet Obstacle Course, where on your way to the refrigerator you leap over sleeping dogs, cats, lizards, and gerbils. Or put that pneumatic power to good use with our gas powered flatulent sofa planking. Your partner will pray even harder for you to start working again and leave town. For a small extra fee, we will send you our alternative reality mirror. This magical device will show you exactly what you will look like in three weeks if you continue on your present regimen. If you cheat and eat a bag of deep-fried Oreos, your reflection will look like Fat Bastard, or worse, Donald Trump. That will certainly scare you back on track. So fear no more about standing up behind the production table and your stomach catching the edge, spilling the monitors, the solar-powered garden gnome, and everything else into the next row. Join the Lumen Lighten Up Club now. And before you know it, you will be ready to once again leap around the theater like a gazelle. Or like that cute ballet dancer you have your eyes on. The Lumen Lighten Up Club, squeezing tons of blubber out of the theater. Is there a monthly plan? A weekly plan, <laughs> yes. a day, daily plan. It's, it could be monthly. No, no, it's it's just monthly. You know, it's you know most people really. I mean, come on, you know when the most exercise machines are sold? It's in January <laughs> because people are making resolutions to lose twenty, thirty pounds. So I don't know. I haven't lost my thirty pounds. And now back to light talk. <laughs> Well, the sound of those crazy ducks tells us that it's time for another installment of Let's Talk About. And the subject for today's Let's Talk About is the amazing Celebrating America inauguration show. Now, I don't know how many people saw this. I saw it. I know Stan and Steve watched it. 
it was basically the evening show on inauguration night and uh, a show that was produced by Ricky Kirshner, by the way. And for people who don't know who Ricky Kirshner is, and Glenn Weiss was also a producer on that. Uh, Ricky has produced some of the greatest shows. He did the DNC convention. So, you know, as soon as Biden got that, it was like, okay, you're going to do the inauguration. He's done Super Bowls. He's done huge, huge shows. Is he related to Don Kirshner? I believe he's Don's son. That would explain it. Don Kirshner was a huge producer in television back in the 70s, right? 70s and 80s. Uh, The guy's amazing. And uh, there's some great articles about this particular production, but they basically only had six weeks to put the whole thing together. It was a show that was live, and most of it was done at the Lincoln Memorial. There are some parts that were done at the White House as well, but most of it was at the Lincoln Memorial around the exterior and the interior of the Lincoln Memorial, and it was cut in with pre-taped performances. Some of the uh, performances were live, and some of them were pre-taped. And I must tell you, it was so beautiful and so emotional for me. It was the end of a very emotional day, which was the end of a very emotional week, week and a half, really, ever since the 6th, we were all like totally wrought out. And this was a celebration of America and of Americans. And it wasn't just performances. There were a lot of ordinary people on it. There was this one section, the guy who uh, feeds the homeless, people who just don't have the money because they lost all their jobs in food lines, and the people who actually chip in and help those people. All the wonderful nurses and medical workers and doctors, they were featured. Some of them were integrated into some of the production numbers, which is fantastic, I must say. And uh, it was just mind-boggling. I loved it, and I cried throughout. So today, before the show, I I wanted to watch it again because I knew we were going to talk about it. And I must tell you, I cried even more. Uh, I I just, uh, it's just so beautiful. For me, there were two great things. Uh, So if we look at the inauguration overall, uh, the thing that I really liked, uh, and then specifically what you're talking about, the thing I really liked was Lady Gaga's rendition. Yeah, Um, yeah. And I thought, you know, it was such such a simple thing, but I had never seen anyone do it before. Mm -hmm. Um, When she turned her back to the audience and looked at the flag flying over the Capitol. I mean, that was a stunning moment. Yes. Because it takes us back, whether you agree with her politics or not, she made us all look at that flag together for a second. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was brilliant. But I'm going to say I got to go with homeboy, uh, Justin Timberlake. Oh, great song. Oh, Great my, song. my, oh, <laughs> at the Stax better, better, Museum, better days. What? How, I mean, I don't know who orchestrated all that and shot that and directed that, but whoever <sighs> it was, you deserve a, a mighty hand on the back. It started out in the studio of the Stax Museum in, in Memphis and moved out into the street. What was so amazing, Steve, oh, yeah, was yeah. that all these performances were done like that. They yeah. were all done sure. with, with different designers, different art directors, uh, and, and, and they were all beautifully done. All of them, from the very simplest performance to something that's a big production number, like that particular one. That was amazing. The Bruce Springsteen at the beginning, The Land of Hopes and Dreams. It was beautiful. Just him and a guitar in front of the Lincoln Memorial with a ring of uh, LED lights around him on the, on the floor. And one LED, it looked like it could have been, it could, it could have been some sort of uh, LED floodlight. Like there was maybe. like four of them on the steps. Yeah, four. No, no, I'm not talking about the steps. There was one that was about six or seven oh, feet oh. up that was just yeah. giving him a little bit of front light. Yeah. That was it. And uh, and, and also That's Tom it. Hanks, yeah. all his front light that was all taken also live at the um, at the Lincoln Memorial. There was a front light that was projecting a very soft shadow. So I assume it was also an LED fixture like well, that. And the way they framed him, like he would be framed in the shot where you uh, sort of like at a particular angle. I'm not a camera cinematographer, but I noticed this. Just the way the shot was framed and, and Lincoln's face up above inside the memorial, he kind of like just like, just juxtaposed against Hank's face. It was just perfectly done. Yeah, all of that. There was a lot of really beautiful, uh, subtle art in all of that. Yeah, and I, I was sort of, you know, back into the question about the master electrician, uh, I was sort of uh, engaged in it through Facebook for days and days before because one of my f- former master electricians who wanted to be a lighting designer but is an electrician programmer, Matt Jenseko, I'm going to call him out, 
who was working for PRG and he does all these big gigs. He does the Super Bowl. He does the, he did the Biden celebration thing in Delaware. Yeah, he and did he, DNC, right? He did yeah, the, the, he did the, the Democratic DNC. National Convention. That's right. right. And he was on this and he said to me, he like telling me, giving me advance notice there's going to be 400 obelisks luminous obelisk alongside the reflecting pool in front of the Lincoln Memorial, each to represent 1,000 dead from COVID. And he was talking about running the DMX and people were asking, are you using, are you using, you know, splitters or, oh, just standard opto splitters, you know, and each one had a single source for inside. And he was giving me all this inside stuff. And, um, you know, posting these pictures. So that started to get me engaged from, and, you know, just pictures of all the PRG boxes alongside the, the pool, you know, when they were, so we got the backstage view from his feed and the onstage view. And, and in terms of the emotional impact of the whole inauguration, um, you know, the fireworks display was, if you, if, when they took those really wide shots, I mean, you, if you've been, to, you've all been to Washington. The mall is two and a half miles from the Capitol to Lincoln, right? And of course, Jefferson is off on the side. Is all, the, the way the whole city is laid out, if you read about Lafayette, it was laid out by a Frenchman, by the way, for those of you who don't think the French love us. Um, it's very, very critical how that, how, how that's organized. And it's, that, but the fireworks with the Lincoln, with the Washington Memorial in the middle, it was, somebody said, it, it felt like 1776 all over again. You know, it was like, you know, we, it's, it was, had the air of a, truly a beginning of an, of an, the end of an era and the beginning of another one. And, the, but the, the whole thing was just, uh, Let, let's give out some notch. props right now. Um, Ricky Kirshner and uh, Glenn Weiss were the producers. The pyro and fireworks was done by Strictly FX, Adam Briscoe, designer. Production design for the COVID-19 Lincoln Memorial, which is where the reflecting pool, what, what Stan was just talking about, the 400 lights. Our friend Bruce Rogers and Tribe did production yeah. design on that and lit by Bob Dickinson. Of course. And Bob has lit everything. And my friend Matt at the console. And <laughs> PRG did up most of the lighting and scenic support. You know, I just have to say it. You know, again, not all of our listeners are Democrats. But That's this, all right. This, they this still goes, appreciate good you know, art. Forget about this as an inauguration. Look at this as just a work of art. Right. With all of our brothers and sisters who've been out of work for a long time. Right. I mean, a lot of people came together and just knocked it out of the ballpark. I mean, you're going over the list of people. I mean, think about the miles and miles of cable that was run. Amazing. Uh, ready if they have to go to um, uh, bad weather. I mean, the logistics of this, to have done this, I think you said, in six weeks from start to finish? Yeah, six weeks. He had six weeks. There's a really interesting uh, interview with him, by the way, uh, with Kirshner, about, you know, they're asking, was it difficult to get talent? He said, are you kidding me? No, they all wanted to be there. They all wanted to do it. And they did it, you know, locally, you know, Memphis, Seattle, wherever they were, L.A. It was funny. I think the only fail, and it's not really good to point fingers, but boy, someone should have given Tom Hanks a good overcoat. He was freezing his butt off out there. And actually, uh, Ricky Kirshen talks about this. He didn't have enough time to go back and get warm because he was constantly coming back live because all that was shot live. You know, all that stuff around the Lincoln Memorial. Did you know the piece of trivia that Tom Hanks is a distant cousin of Abraham Lincoln? No, I didn't. Yes, his mother's, his uh, uh, Hanks was Lincoln's mother's maiden name. Again, I'm just going to list some things that I thought were really, really, really outrageously good. Some moments, starting off with Tom Hanks. I mean, you couldn't pick a better person to MC this, right? Bruce Springsteen, Land of Hopes and Dreams. Yo-Yo Ma's rendition of Amazing Grace. As Steve said, Justin Timberlake and Aunt Clemens, Better Days from the Stax Museum. The Black Pumas coming from Austin, yeah. uh, performing colors. They did that like in some empty theater there. Oh, my God. That was Austin City Limits. Beautiful lighting there. 
Uh, Dave Grohl and the Foo Fighters, their dedication to teachers, times like these. Again, great lighting. I love the swags they had behind there. Very sensitive for the opening part where just the Hammond and the voice. And then when they go and rock out, it like gets really, really, really exciting. Beautiful lighting design. And I love the whole Seasons of Love and Let the Sunshine In Zoom style thing they did with all those celebrities. I thought that was beautiful. Lin-Manuel Miranda reciting The Cure of Troy by Seamus Haney in an empty theater in Brooklyn. The astronauts coming from the International Space Station. The COVID-19 Memorial. Uh, John Legend feeling good, beautifully lit. Again, just a backlight and a front light on him. Boom, done. Then the reflection of the memorial and the piano lid. Boy, that was brilliant when whoever came up with that. Taylor Hubbard and Tim McGraw on a pier in Nashville. <laughs> uh, Demi Lovato in L.A. Uh, doing Lovely Day in front of the awesome curved projection screen of doctors and nurses singing and dancing. And they have some cameos that throw in there. And then the Bidens watching from the Oval Office, dancing around. That was so cool. And then finally, Katy Perry at the finale. And as Stan said, the most amazing fireworks behind her. And those shots of the Bidens watching them and the Harrises watching them and being silhouetted by those fireworks. Boy, really brilliant work. Really brilliant work. My favorite cue, I forget who was standing at the edge of the reflection pool and all of those obelisks, on the, the 400 of them, there was a cue. One at a time, they lit up. Boom, 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 boom. Like they chased open. The di- oh, it was just... That was the simplest, most effective cue I think I've seen maybe in a lifetime. I hope that's a permanent thing. I hope they leave No, it won't be. It would be so beautiful. It can't be. Yeah. No, it can't be. All right. Well, if you haven't seen it, we're going to give you a link for the show. You can watch the whole show. The best part of it, there were no commercials, and it was fantastic. I'm going to go lazy next week and show this to my first-year design class. Absolutely. One thing we didn't talk about, and the whole reason why I wanted to talk about this today, was the fact that it really shows you how to light something very effectively. Simple. Simply, right? Quickly, and incorporate the beauty around. I mean, whether whether you're doing the reflecting pool or you're doing the Lincoln Memorial, and just lighting the steps, as Stan said, you know, very simple, very simple, and stunningly, stunningly lit. So kudos. Kudos to everybody. That's why I love architectural lighting. So Steve has our last question of the day. Okay. And it is from Roger in Indy. And Roger writes, I need a mirror ball effect that spins on an east-west axis, not on a (laughs) north-south axis. I've been been trying to imagine this since I read this question. Maybe a gyroscope. (laughs) Any idea where I can find one? Piece of cake, Roger. But first, I would like to reflect on the mirror ball as metaphor for life. And to make my point, I would like to quote Sylvester in his or her 1988 American disco classic, Can't Stop Dancing. (laughs) On the night I first met you, you made all my dreams come true. And I said to myself that I would never stop dancing. When my feet first hit the floor, I jumped and boogied, then I screamed some more. And when we kissed, I swore I would never stop dancing. Roger, I'm a sucker for disco balls. You know, there, I said it. If anywhere or anything includes a mirror ball, I'm immediately all in. I'm like a moth drawn to its shimmering, glittering flame. You know, beyond my my little lizard brain fixation with shiny objects, Disco balls can be harnessed as a complex symbol, a metaphor for community, excess, escapism, utopia, self-fashioned identity, and even safety in numbers. But what you're looking for is a horizontal axis mirror ball. That's a piece of cake. It is a mirror ball that runs on a horizontal axis, and you can buy those things. It has an internal motor. And if it's too expensive for you, just build your own. Think uh, chicken rotisserie. Yep. That's all you got to do. Yeah. Or look at the uh, one of the first um, tours of uh, Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, and they had one there. You just, could probably rent that one. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just stick a shish kebab through it and stick a motor on the end. There you go. 
Well, the rocking sounds of the Luminoids tells us that once again you spent another morning listening to Light Talk. You can hear our show on Spotify, iTunes, Google, YouTube, and just about every podcast site out there. Check out our website on lighttalk.org for future guests, and be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to the podcast. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk Insanity. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. However... If you do decide to litigate, the law firm Reflect, Fluck, Flare, and Glare and their paralegal snoot will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers, coming to you from Long Beach, Gainesville, and the Republic of Texas. And be sure to join us next week when we talk about more happenings in our crazy industry. All of that and a new sponsor. Light Talk, broadcasting questionable Lumen knowledge and humor around the world. So I'll see you all next Saturday morning. Bye-bye from Lighthouse. And welcome to America. Toodles. <laughs>